Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored reviews exist for a reason. Namely, that I need money to live, and there are a lot of things that people have wanted me to review over the years, and they've grown impatient waiting for me to just do them. Now, other people are content to merely send me a comic via my P.O. box, handily found on the contact page of my website, and hope that the sheer what-the-hell factor will get me to do it which a lot of times it has. The Star Trek Flesh and Stone review from a few weeks ago was one of those, in fact. Sometimes, however, there is a bizarre overlap. I received Dart number 1 to 3 in my P.O. box along with $100 and a note that said, Review these. And since you can see the title of the episode, I chose to do so. However, here is why I'm talking about this in the introduction. In the future, don't do this. From now on, if you send me money outside of Patreon along with a request to do something, sorry, but I'm keeping the money and it's a crapshoot whether I'll actually review it. When I first started the Patreon, there were four review slots that were relatively cheap, and I soon realized the mistake of that and limited it to just two and doubled the price. They filled up so often that if I didn't restrict it to that, I wouldn't be able to look at anything that I wanted to review. A lot of you guys really want me to look at stuff, some of which is stuff I would never have contemplated to do for the show, and rest assured there are more to come this year. And it's okay to look at different stuff here. This may be where bad comics burn, but breaking away from the regular routine is fun and helps keep things fresh. And hey, didn't we all need to know about the pedophile dog from a visual novel? The answer is no. But yeah, the Patreon slots are in very high demand. I get messages every week from people asking when the slot will be open for them to make a request. But of course, the answer is it's first come, first serve. The best time to look for an opening is the beginning of the month, since that's when Patreon charges people, and those people usually can't keep paying me $80 a month for extended periods of time, especially when they're only allowed a single request every six months. But the point is that a lot of people want to use the system I have set up to do this, and just sending me money cheats those who have been very patient for their chance. So yes, in this one instance, I will take the money and do as asked, but from now on, you can send me a thousand dollars and a bunch of My Little Pony comics to review, but unless it was through the Patreon, I'm not going to be reviewing them. Spoilers, later this year I'm going to be looking at some My Little Pony comics. And with that reminder that I am a windbag out of the way, let's talk about Dart. Dart first appeared in the pages of Savage Dragon, Eric Larson's book when he and the others first started Image Comics. We've technically already seen her before on this show, sort of, in Freak Force number one. And sadly, I don't remember a thing about it. Not because Freak Force is unmemorable, which it is, but rather because 90s Kid did that episode. Where the hell is 90s Kid, anyway? Since I still haven't looked at anything related to Savage Dragon yet, yeah, that's something I should really rectify given all the other image books I've covered, I have to rely on Wikipedia and other online sources to find any info on her. What I can say is that unlike Liefeld's stable of interchangeable generic characters, she actually has a gimmick that's kind of interesting. She possesses deadly accuracy with throwing objects, in particular darts. The miniseries, of which the first issue I'm reviewing today, gave her a backstory that was a apparently declared to be non-canon by Eric Larson. Which makes me wonder why one of his characters was allowed to have an origin he didn't approve of, given how I understand Image worked even in 1996, but whatever. So let's dig into Dart number one and see what was so awful about a mid-90s Image comic. Can't imagine what will be wrong with it. It could be your 
The cover is a bit odd in its coloring. It looks very washed out and light, which admittedly makes it look different from a lot of Image's other output at the time, where the name of the game was dark or incomprehensible. But no, we can see this cover just fine. And it's a pity that it looks like crap. Aside from the fact that Dart's eyes look huge. Big, googly anime eyes. Something seems off about her proportions. The head seems bigger thanks to the massive amount of hair flowing everywhere and the giant eyes and lips, but tiny nose. I think this would actually look fine if those were reined in a bit. Just look at how much hair that is. Starfire is jealous about the personal blanket she's sporting. Then again, the cover itself does not exactly impress even if the artwork was good. It's not a good sign for your first issue when it features your title character literally sitting in garbage. Garbage. I'm not fond of the logo either. I give it points for looking unique, and I think the idea is to give it a very pointy look for, you know, darts and all, but it ends up just looking more techno-y, especially with how some of the letters are stylized to look like the number one. We open in Detroit. Detroit, 1990. A soiled playground of crime and corruption. Don't worry, I hear that Robocop is coming in to fix all this. Now, at first it may appear that the artwork is just really amateurish, but what we're actually seeing in these panels is a bunch of kids playing with action figures. And then when we pull back, we see that the art is bad, just differently, as we see a bunch of big-eyed children playing. Can we swap now? I'm tired of bring... Er, um, nice typo. I'm tired of being Meteor. I want to be Shaq. Why do you want to be Shaq? Be Charles Barkley. He's Earth's greatest warrior. Also, not just that one typo. She's also got a run-on sentence. Two girls in particular are playing with a doll called Cyrene, whose legs pop off. Oh, you've broken her. It's all right. Cyrene's legs come off so you can put her tail on. Man, I can't wait until I get the mechanical spider legs attachment for my birthday. We soon see that the children are being observed in a high-tech laboratory behind some one-way glass. Now, here we get a better idea of the problems of the art. Distance shots look fine, but when we get close up, they're very cartoony. Except I'm dead certain they weren't going for cartoony. Just that their features are bigger and more exaggerated because they didn't know how to scale things. So, what sort of research are they doing? Alright, these toys will inevitably promote violence, sibling rivalry, nihilistic and truculent behavior. This is the factory where they make beanie babies. Look, just give me the bottom line! They'll be a big hit, Mr. Brockman. Rom Space Knight is gonna just print money! Also, the one thing all toy manufacturers need in their research, a dominatrix. But let's unpack this look, shall we? Pink skin. Okay, it's a superhero universe, I'll grant that. Beehive hairdo that is taller than her face. With how Dart looked on the cover, apparently her and this woman are gonna get into a hair fight a la Uzumaki. And let's not even get into how her corset has condensed her stomach to the width of her head. She's also standing wonderfully by kinda sorta leaning over, but not really, since her upper body is straight up, but her ass is pushed out behind her, while her legs legs are twice the length of her upper body. And really, what the hell is the deal with her pants, dress, skirt thing? It's forming around her, but then just stops being a dress when it reaches her knees, then splits off into completely useless pants since they expose her calves and then turn into high heels. Good lord, it's like she's a rubber bendy doll that's been stretched beyond recognition. What is this? What the hell is this? There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. And then there's fish-lipped guy here looking in on the children. I'm not so sure. They're great toys, but something's missing. Yeah, a comma for your two complete thoughts. Well, it's not us, Gregory. There's nothing wrong with Vogue Attack. Vogue Attack? Well, I guess that explains your outfit since you're against anything fashionable. No. No, it's not you, Mistress Brouhaha. Somebody woke up one day and said, I'm gonna name a character Mistress Brouhaha and get a paycheck for it. It's blood chic. These characters are just so unique, so different to any other superhero action figures, that they need a bridging character. I get the impression they're trying to make fun of stuff as generic and lame as Youngblood in a book that is itself generic and lame. 
Mistress Brouhaha says that Blood Sheik will object to adding a new member for the toys, but Captain Mustache here says that it doesn't matter, since both Vogue Attack and Blood Sheik signed away their likeness rights already for the toys. Yeah, and I'm sure you guys are really known for making good toy-based decisions, considering you decided Dominatrix Barbie here was gonna be the next Tickle Me Elmo. Anyway, Mustache Dude, aka Mr. Brockman, proceeds to ignore everyone who greets him and wants to talk about sales figures so he can go down to the basement and berate an artist under his employ. Leah, put those forest folk trademark away. You know we finished with them. Nice comma splice, asshole. Also, she's just holding the damn toy. What the hell difference does that make? Anyway, Fish Lips and really pronounced cheekbones says that he needs her to make a new character for the toy line. But the forest folk trademark are our bread and butter. It's not good karma for us to abandon them. Well, good to know that you're in charge of the company then, conceptual artist lady. However, Brockman completely overreacts and grabs her arm and throws her papers aside. Dude, what the hell? Get it through your thick head! Forest gum trademark is dead! These designs went out in the 80s. Nobody's interested in this crap anymore. People will only care about this stuff again in the late 2000s when it's profitably nostalgic. This is my deal. You have no say in the matter. Just because you can design a few simple toys doesn't mean you've got talent. God, all I did was hire you at our major toy company as our only conceptual artist and told you to work on this design that will shape our product line. You have absolutely no talent whatsoever. Now you sit there, comma splice. And don't leave this room, comma splice. Not even to E. And another comma splice. Until you design the character I want! Leave your stupid comments in your pocket. Jeez, if this guy's got fish lips, then she's got massive worm lips. Why are her lips so huge? In fact, why are her eyes so huge, too? What the hell's wrong with everybody's face? Just remember, if it wasn't for my entrepreneurial skills, you would still be nothing on the streets with the rest of this city's victims. Yes, she's truly avoided becoming a victim by becoming a victim of your out of control random abuse. You're lucky she doesn't shove that elf toy up your ass as her resignation. Speaking of potential victims, a woman with a giant head runs through an alley pursued by some guys with knives. Hey, Missy, got a quarter for my bus fare? Hey! Oh, screw off then, you friggin' bitch! How dare you not give me a quarter! I'm gonna stab you! Seriously, what the hell is it about guys in this book who overreact to women? I mean, I have to assume that's what's happening, since otherwise they're using a really weird way of taunting her. By asking for a quarter, then being shocked and calling her a bitch. Now, a more effectively creepy method of taunting is what they do next. Spouting a nursery rhyme. Georgie Porgy, puddin' in pie. Georgie Porgy, victim of cannibalism. Kissed the girls and made them cry. Georgie had mono. However, the rhyming doesn't actually make sense, since they say the next line about the boys coming out to play, then stop doing it as they attack the woman, requiring Dart to appear and say the final line of Georgie Porgy running away. What was their end game with the rhyme if they weren't going to say the final line? Might as well have just recited Hickory Dickory Doc if they were just doing it to be creepy. But anywho, here's Dart. And her pointy nipples and shiny costume, and yet again over-exaggerated lips. Everyone in this comic has very clearly defined lips of some variety, and the women in particular have gotten collagen injections. Hey guys, check out this broad! Why is that a question? Eh, screw it. Looks... Like the Silver Surfer's sex-starved sister! Sick burn! And you look like the feces of feces. Probably because you are feces. Gee, Spider, that was a nice bit of litter... Litter... Litination. If you don't know the word, why are you trying to say it? Dart, of course, attacks and kicks two of them with a rather impractical pose, probably meant to show off her ass. But then she gets whacked in the back of the head with a 2 by 4 No! Wooden boards! My one weakness! 
We then get a flashback to her childhood, where her abusive father almost beats her after she attempts to call 911, but instead her mother intervenes and gets murdered. The cops, of course, arrive from the 911 call, but it's too late. She is now the size of a baby doll. Or maybe that cop is a giant, I don't know. If the kid had spoken to the operator sooner, maybe we could have saved the mother. She's also the reason for all the suffering in the world, really. In fact, when you get right down to it, she's the reason God has abandoned us all. Hell, the other cop isn't any better, saying that she was long dead and eating carpet before that was a factor. You know, I understand the humor is a defense mechanism, but criminy, wait until the kid isn't around before you say that crap. What would Joe Friday say? Sit back and take a real hard look. Look at the victims of these crimes and try to have a little empathy. It might do you some good. That's what we're all here for, to serve these people. Now, if you can't see it that way, maybe you better look for some other kind of job. I'm sure the department can spare you. For crying out loud, the corpse needs to tell them to knock it off! Wow, that is unfortunate word balloon placement. Jeez. Anyway, Dart wakes up from her flashback and realizes there's no time for that now. She needs to leap around in a way that should get her hair tangled up before she kicks these assholes some more. But I think the real point of this is, look at how huge her breasts are. One of them runs off. Isn't that a typical male response? Hit on you, then run. Really? Because from what I've seen, the typical reaction is hit on you, then keep hitting on you even after you've told them to piss off. But perhaps he was just frightened of the fact that your body proportions have gone all over the place. With a giant head, a stomach thinner than said giant head, and you posing weirdly while you throw a dart. And dart in the ass. You shot my butt! What the hell? You shot me in the butt! Another guy, this one with a mohawk, grabs her by her hair and knees her in the ass. Hey, no fair taking advantage of the crappy artwork to do that. But she flips him over and darts him. Nearby, I think. Establishing shots, what are those? Some guy is recording the fight. Oh yeah, that's it. Do it to him, baby. Oh, that's hot. Too much. I'm not too fond of the Nostalgia Critic's new cameraman. This is gonna make me a fortune. A person would sell their mother to get hold of this sort of stuff. Footage of a woman beating up criminals? Whew. Farewell drug trade, we found the real moneymaker here. His wife, or girlfriend or whatever, asks him what he's doing, in particular if he's coming back to bed. This is in spite of the fact that he is wearing a towel and she appears to be coming out of the bathroom. I don't know, maybe they were just nude in bed and it's a sheet, but why does it look like they woke up, took a shower, and then decided to go back to bed? Anyway, the fight is still going on, especially with the arrival of a hero with a pencil-thin mustache who... Wait a second, that logo... Kaiba Corp? I'm the goddamn Kaiba man. I mean, admittedly, the actual Kaiba Corp logo has an offset, but that is supposed to be a stylized K and C, so you can understand my confusion. So anyway, this is Kill Cat. Yeah. Both he and Dart tackle the last guy, and given that snap sound effect, I'm pretty sure his spine is broken, and he's quite dead. Kill Cat then hits on Dart, because that's what we needed in this comic, more creepy weirdos. Back over to the toy factory, Brockman sees the news report about Dart, while the artist lady keeps trying to come up with superhero designs without success. This station has obtained exclusive footage of the actual assault videoed by a concerned citizen. We'd like to warn that some of the following bloody scenes of gut-wrenching carnage may be a little disturbing to some viewers. I'm not kidding, people. A man got a dart in his butt cheek. Viewer discretion is advised. Kill Cat even remained behind to be interviewed. Dart, if you're watching this report, call me, comma, instead of a period. And in the book under Kill Cat. Of the Boston Kill Cats, no doubt. Mmm, dart. Mmm, badly drawn stubby hand. Morning, in a city that doesn't care. Trust me, it's not the only thing that doesn't care. Although I'd probably care just for the fact that the sun is huge! Anyway, the artist, Leah, has fallen asleep at her art table as Brockman shows up to check out her designs. But he rejects them. They all look like forest folk, trademark, on steroids! You're hopeless! You can't draw to save your life! Then why did you hire her? You are a crappy boss! 
He insists that they use Dart's name and likeness despite not owning the rights to the name. When she points that out, he whacks her across the face with a newspaper. Apparently he hit her so hard with that newspaper that it draws blood. What the hell? I can do anything I want. This city is my playground. I am Brockman, owner of a toy company. All shall bow down before me. Careful, lady, he's aiming an invisible gun at you! And so our comic ends with him proclaiming that he has the solution to this. And they're called Vogue Attack! Witness their ultimate power of teleporting in when I say their name! This comic sucks! Aside from the absolutely dreadful artwork, Dart feels like a side character in her own damn miniseries. The majority of the comic actually focuses on Brockman's toy crap and his inexplicable abuse of an artist for seemingly no reason. When we do see Dart, it's just for a lame fight scene and a backstory that got retconned by the actual creator of the character. It's bland, it's stupid, and it's poorly drawn. I think the funniest part of all of this is that while the story is centered around toys, the back that cover of the comic features an ad for a completely unnecessary toy crossover between Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Savage Dragon. Together, they're the baddest force for good. Next time, we head over to Batman shenanigans for the conclusion of the Leaves of Grass three-parter, since marijuana seems like a good idea after this crap. to his mustache in this panel? Is it actually some interdimensional parasite that can disappear at will?